I'm going to try to actually um, start from, from the beginning a little bit, talk about the basics of neural nets. And I realize uh, Jeff might have given a talk that was kind of uh, assuming quite a bit more uh, background. Um, and uh, it would have been better if I had given that talk first, but uh, I couldn't come earlier this morning. Um, and so we had to, to set the, the talks in, the, in that particular order. Let me start by saying that I guess one of the reasons you, you are here or you, you might be interested in this program is because of uh, something relatively new that's uh, happening in machine learning, which is the uh, idea of not just uh, training classifiers, but of learning representations. And I'm sure you've heard uh, a bunch of examples of algorithms that do this this morning, and you'll hear a few more uh, today, and certainly tomorrow, and in the next two weeks, or three weeks. And so learning representations is really the, the big question that uh, we're all uh, asking ourselves. And you know, it's something that uh, uh, some of us have been interested in in a very long time. But I have to say the topic was really not that hot in machine learning until about five, six, seven years ago when uh, essentially Jeff revived the, the field by finding new algorithms that uh, had different properties from the ones that people were trying 20 or 25 years ago. And so that sort of spurred uh, renewed interest in those questions. Uh, there's also the fact that machine learning is, has become so pervasive nowadays that uh, there's more and more applications that machine learning sh uh, needs to be applied to, and there's just not enough people to design all the feature sets that are necessary for all of those applications. And so if we had an automated way of learning the features, that would be just much more efficient. But really what, uh, what some of us are interested in is, um, is you know, learning perception, uh, building intelligent machines and things like this, and you can't do this without uh, a system that can learn, rep learn representations. Uh, there's also a connection with uh, uh, biology in the sense that um, uh, th there's sort of a historical connection between work in deep learning and, and work in uh, uh, sort of the search for biologically plausible learning rules or learning algorithms uh, explaining how the brain learns, basically. Um, but, but you can ignore this if you want. Uh, there'll be a few biologists giving talks during this, this summer school, but... Um, uh, but if you are strictly interested in the sort of technological aspect of things, you don't necessarily have to worry about the biological side or vice versa. Um, but uh, historically, there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, interaction and inspiration both ways. Um, okay, so um, as, as many of you probably know, the, the, the classic way of doing pattern recognition or machine learning is you, you take an input, you feed it to some sort of feature extractor, and then you stick your favorite uh, classification algorithm on top, which you train. Um, and this part is generally handcrafted or built by hand. And this is the part that uh, is subject to learning. Um, however, this picture is really not quite accurate for more recent uh, approaches to, say, image recognition or speech recognition or audio processing. Uh, the, the sort of more mainstream model now has one more box in the middle here. So it's got low-level features that are built by hand. Uh, things in, in image recognition um, are called SIFT or HOG or, or names of that kind. And in audio and speech recognition called MFCCs or constant Q transform or whatever. So there's a, a number of different uh, uh, features that uh, people have come up with for particular types of signals and are, they're, they're kind of used uh, in combinations over and over again for, for various, uh, various things. And there are versions of this for video, for um, you know, LiDAR instead of just regular images and things like that. And so there's a lot of work in, uh, in computer vision and, and speech on, on, on what you put in this box. Uh, speech, not so much, actually. That's pretty much settled. Uh, but what's new in this, uh, in this model is that there is a, another box here, which I guess we could call mid-level feature extraction. And this one almost always has some learning in it, even in the mainstream systems that are not, uh, uh, that don't, kind of uh, claim to be connected with deep learning at all. Um, there's some sort of unsupervised learning taking place for extracting those mid-level features. In the case of speech recognition, uh, this is uh, uh, generally implemented through mixtures of Gaussians, uh, although that's actually technically supervised. Uh, in, in computer vision, um, those mid-level features are extracted using clustering algorithms, such as k-means, or sparse coding for the more recent ones, or some versions of this, like Fisher uh, vectors and things like that which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but suffice to say that uh, there is some sort of non-unsupervised uh, learning going on in the mid-level. 
because just plugging your favorite classifier on low-level features just doesn't work good enough, except for very simple uh, tasks. Uh, so there is, there, there is a need to kind of um, uh, produce more abstract representations. And those were, by the way, uh, to some extent inspired by uh, work in, older work in, in neural nets and deep learning. Um, and then you, you stick your favorite classifier. Doesn't matter what it is. So that's the mainstream approach. Um, and if you look at uh, biology now to get a little inspiration from this, uh, things are quite, quite a bit different there. Uh, much more hierarchical. So if, if you think about the, the, the sort of trajectory that the signal follows in the, in the visual cortex uh, in humans, it goes through kind of a number of different stages. And uh, as you go through the stages, the representation of the, uh, of the percept becomes more and more abstract. Uh, each neuron represents a more and more a, a kind of larger area of the visual field and kind of a more abstract concept on, on this. On, on the whatever is present within its uh, field of view, um, and also more invariant to irrelevant transformations of uh, of, of the uh, of the input image. So this looks more like a like a hierarchy um, than sort of just a, a, a two level or three level uh, hierarchy that I was uh, showing you earlier. Um, and there's uh, good reasons to believe that all of those uh, stages are, are are trained or trainable. Um, so neuroscientists have, have come up with you know, those kind of block diagrams of uh, the visual cortex. Um, this is from Gallant and Van Essen. Uh, this, this figure is from Simon Thorpe. He's a psychophysicist who is, um, has shown that uh, sort of relatively simple recognition tasks can be done extremely quickly by the human uh, visual cortex. And uh, he uses this as an argument to show that there is very little um, impact of feedback connections because there's just no time for them to have an effect. And so a lot of us are using this as an excuse to concentrate on feedforward architectures. It's a very bad excuse, um, but it's, uh, it's an excuse we are very happy to use. And so, um, so this is not to say that the visual processing um, in humans or animals does not rely on feedback. There is a huge amount of feedback. In fact, there's more feedback connections in the visual context than there are feedforward connections, oddly enough. Um, but at least there are certain, uh, there's a number of uh, complicated recognition tasks that we can do without feedback, apparently without much feedback. Um, so that has prompted uh, people to concentrate on feedforward architectures, which uh, you'll hear about. The other thing about vision is that it's a computationally very complicated, very complex and expensive uh, computation. And the, the way we know that is because a, a big piece of our brains, or, or the macaque brain in that, in that case, um, is devoted to vision. Uh, about a third of our brains, basically, or maybe a quarter, um, is entirely devoted to vision. So that means that computationally it's expensive, uh, and it, otherwise nature would have found a way of kind of getting around it. Um, but there's no way around it, it's really expensive. Um, and, um, and the architecture is, is deep in the sense that it has uh, multiple layers, maybe 10, something like that. Um, so the picture we would like to, 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 to replace the sort of mainstream approach to pattern recognition uh, by is something like this, where we have uh, a, a series of modules, each of which are, are trainable, and kind of turns the representation coming into them uh, into a sort of slightly higher level representation, uh, more invariant, more global, et cetera. Uh, and such, uh, such hierarchies exist in, uh, not only in image, uh, but also in audio where um, segments of sounds are assembled into uh, elementary uh, sounds, which uh, speech people call phones, and then phonemes, and words, and sentences. For images, it's more like uh, elementary features, like oriented edges, and local motifs, or textons, and then parts of objects, objects, scenes. Um, and you have kind of similar hierarchies also in text and um, various other modalities. So this notion of hierarchy is kind of very, uh, very powerful. So now you, you start talking about these hierarchies and then uh, you have a bunch of theorists coming to you and say, well, why would you need a hierarchy at all? Uh, we can approximate any function as close as we want with a shadow architecture, where, so we don't actually need deep architectures. So, um, so if you like super vector machines, for example, kernel machines, uh, you, you can say, well, you know, if I properly choose my, my kernel function here, uh, which is used to compare an input vector x to uh, every training sample I have, and then I sort of linearly combine the output of this kernel function, 
I can pretty much show that uh, if I tune this kernel function appropriately, and if I choose the alpha parameters properly, I can pretty much approximate any function on my training set that I want. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that um, it, it doesn't say anything about uh, generalization. Of course, there are results on generalization of super vector machines, but they, they essentially depend on uh, you know, how many non-zero alphas you can, you, you, you can use to approximate your function. And no one is going to tell you that until you train your machine. Uh, so there's no guarantee that this representation would be efficient in the sense that depending on which kernel function you choose, it might be that you'll need a very, very large number of terms in the sum to approximate uh, a reasonable function. Okay. Um, so it's very difficult, for example, to do computer vision with a function of that form if, uh, if this uh, kernel function basically compares images with each other, even if it's a fairly complex distance measure that you use. Uh, because what you're doing is essentially glorified template matching. You're comparing the input image to a whole bunch of templates, and then you're kind of combining the scores of how well those things match. So that's kind of glorified template matching. Um, and we know that can't work because it's, it's subject to the curse of dimensionality. If, you, if, if you're going to compare images to each other, you're going to have to cover a huge uh, space to be able to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, take into account all the possible variations and things like that. Um, so the solution to this, of course, is uh, that uh, if you are interested in kernels, that, that, that you could do is you could parameterize this kernel and try to learn it, but that comes down to doing deep learning. Um, so why, why would it be better to have uh, multiple layers, which is kind of symbolized by this sort of chain of linear and nonlinear operations here that are kind of successively applied to the input uh, to produce the output? And and there is a bunch of hand-wavy arguments about this that are supported by uh, theoretical results. Unfortunately, the theoretical results don't totally apply to the situation we're interested in, but they are kind of a hint of, uh, of what goes on. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, there's a number, if, if you count how many Boolean functions can be implemented with only two layers, okay? Basically, every Boolean function of n bits can be implemented with essentially two layers of, of Boolean functions which you can think of as two layer of nonlinearities. And that's because every Boolean function can be written in either a disjunctive normal form or conjunctive normal form, where you take an and of all the variables and then you make an or of the results and you have a few nots in between and you can approximate any, uh, I mean, you can compute any Boolean function that way, right? The problem is uh, almost all Boolean functions require an exponential number of min terms in that, uh, in that disjunctive or conjunctive normal form. There's only an exponentially small number of functions that are not exponential in that representation. Um, but then the interesting thing is that if you allow yourself to have more than just two layers, then there's a lot more functions that become non-exponential all of a sudden. So that's kind of a hint to suggest that if you allow yourself to use more, uh, more layers, essentially more steps in the computation, in the sequential computation, you can reduce the uh, effective complexity of the of the, uh, of the widget that is going to compute it by perhaps an exponential uh, factor. Um, so to take a, a simple example, uh, let's take uh, the n-bit parity function, right? So you have n bits, and the output is, is, is supposed to tell you if the number of uh, ones on the input is even or odd, OK? Um, you can do this with two layers. It requires an exponential number of min terms. Uh, but you can also do it with a number of uh, gates that is linear in, the num in n, in fact, equal to n minus 1, um, each of which is an XOR gate. And you, bu you build a tree out of them, and, uh, and that gives you the parity of the n bits. Right? So by allowing a logarithmic number of layers, you uh, reduce the complexity of the function from exponential to, to uh, linear. Um, here's another example, addition of two uh, uh, binary numbers, two n-bit binary numbers. Uh, there's an obvious solution of this uh, that's sequential that consists in you know, adding uh, bits uh, one by one and propagating the carry. And that's a, the circuit here has a depth equal to the number of bits. Okay, but the complexity, again, is linear in, in the number of bits because you just, just need to have uh, you know, single bit adders with uh, carry propagation. Um, Whereas if you want to implement it with just, uh, just two layers, it's going to cost you a nominal leg. I'm not sure it's exponential, but it's, uh, it's, it's expensive. Um, so essentially what I'm, 
talking about here is kind of a very simple thing that we've all experienced as, as programmers, which is uh, the, the trade-off between uh, memory and, uh, and time. We can always, we compute a function, we can store it in a table, and then if the table can be accessed quickly, um, that means the depth of the computation is very, uh, is very low. Or we can have an approximation algorithm that's going to compute, you know, or sign table or logarithm or whatever it is. It's going to take longer, but, um, um, but it's not as expensive in memory. So it's the same kind of idea here, which you can have, we can have a, a sort of a trade-off between how big the, the circuit is that is going to implement the function uh, and how many steps it's going to take. And by allowing more, more steps to be taken, you reduce possibly the number of... Uh, of, of widgets that are necessary to compute it by uh, perhaps a very large uh, ratio. So that's kind of a semi uh, hand wavy theoretical ish argument for deep architectures. Um, let me skip this. This is a recycling of one of Jeff's uh, joke. Um, he can get, he can make that joke if he wants. Um, <clears throat> Right, so the, the problem with, with deep learning is that if we're going to train a supervised uh, machine to um, a deep supervised machine, it's, it's actually quite hard. It's hard because the functions we need to optimize are very highly non-convex. Um, they're not actually as ugly as you might think, uh, but they're still ugly. And, um, um, and the other thing is that we're going to need quite a bit of examples to be able to train those machines because the bigger they are, the more parameters they have and the more training samples are required to train them properly without overfitting. Okay, so first there is an interesting remark you can make, which is that, um, so we're going to train those you know, with gradient descent or whatever. We're going to compute the gradient. You know, we're going to have a deep architecture. We're going to compute the gradient of some cost function with respect to all the parameters in the machine and adjust them. That's the supervised way of training uh, a neural net, essentially, or any kind of architecture. Um, and the two things you can, you, you can uh, remark, the first thing is that it's much more difficult to train a, uh, a tall and skinny neural net. So a neural net that has lots and lots of layers where they're all about the same size or maybe some of them are, are, are you know, narrower than the input. Uh, it's relatively hard to train something like this. It's much easier to train one that actually happens to be, uh, have wide layers. And the reason is because if they have wide layers, you just have more chances of finding a good solution by just chance. Um, so for example, if you imagine a two-layer neural net where the first layer has a practically infinite number of hidden units, um, then all the weight configuration, if you, um, all the possible weight configurations will already be present in your first layer. And so to learn any function, you only need to train the second layer. You don't actually need to train the first layer. Um, and so what that tells you is that uh, kind of sh you know, shadow and fat networks uh, with a fixed first layer uh, are easy to train, but uh, they're not that different from, say, a super vector machine. Um, OK, so let's talk about um, how we build architectures for, for training for, for just a minute. Um, so the classical way of getting around the, the problem or the limitations of things like linear classifiers, uh, and I'm kind of assuming this is known by most of the audience, but perhaps not, um, is that you expand, uh, which is very similar to the, the first slide I showed where we had a feature extractor. You take your input vector and you kind of expand this feature vector into a high dimensional representation using a nonlinear mapping uh, in such a way that uh, things in this high dimensional space are more easily uh, separable or classifiable, if you want. And things in high dimension are more easily classifiable. There's an old theorem by uh, Tom Cover from the 60s um, that says that um, if you have p points in an n dimensional space, there's a very high probability that those p points would be linearly separable, whatever labels you put on those p points, if p is less than n. But if p is larger than n, then the probability goes to zero very quickly. So, in other words, uh, if you have more training samples than you have dimensions in your representation, uh, then chances are uh, for a random labeling that this labeling is not easily separable by a simple linear classifier. Um, and so, so the trick is to expand the dimension. So if you have here a, a three-dimensional input, you expand it to a higher dimension, and that allows uh, more separability of the, of the samples. Okay, and the question is how do you build this? 
Um, so the classical approach is to, is to uh, use knowledge about the, the problem to build this. The second uh, possibility is to use kind of a standard set of basis functions that are more or less generic. And that's pretty much the approach that super vector machines use. Uh, so super vector machines uh, in particular uh, use a very, very simple form of unsupervised learning, if you wish, uh, in their first layer. So you can think of a super vector machine as a two layer machine in which the first layer compares the input vector to every training sample or a significant subset of the training samples. And then it gives you kind of a, a result which is the output of the kernel function applied to the input and the corresponding training sample. And, and then you compute a linear, uh, uh, you know, a linear combination of those uh, answers to produce the, um, of those uh, outputs to, to produce the, uh, the ultimate answer. Um, and so you could think of the first layer of a super vector machine as being trained in, un in an unsupervised manner. It's a very simple training, which consists in taking your entire training set and writing your uh, training samples into the, into the, the, uh, the parameters of all, of all of those units, if you want, okay? So, so the, the function that this layer will compute depends on the training sample, it depends on the training set, but does not depend on the labels. So that's kind of a, practically a definition of unsupervised learning. Um, and so to some extent, super vector machines do the simplest possible form of deep learning. Unsupervised learning for the first layer, supervised learning for the second layer. The second layer is, uh, is linear, and the first layer, you just have to choose the, your kernel function appropriately. And of course, the trick of SVMs is that, you know, not all of those coefficients will be, zero, will be non-zero, so some of those things can be dropped. Um, uh, but we don't, we, you know, we can't escape from this very simple picture of what a super vector, vector machine does. So regardless of what complicated mathematics goes around it, which is really cute, this is what a super vector machine does, and that's all it does. So, um, okay, so to, to go a little, uh, to give a little more flexibility to the architecture, we need to uh, go to multi-module architectures. And so this is something that um, uh, Clément and James will probably talk, talk, uh, tell you about uh, tomorrow in one of the practical sessions um, when they take you through training neural nets with backprop. And they use this model I'm going to explain. Um, so to train a, a supervised uh, machine, uh, most of you probably know already, you, uh, you have some parameterized function and you plug it into some sort of uh, cost or criterion or whatever you want to call it. Um, and what you want to do is minimize the average value of this criterion over a training set, um, maybe with some regularizer. And what you need to do is uh, uh, figure out the gradient of, the, of this cost function you want to minimize with respect to the parameters of your box here, and uh, so you can do gradient descent learning. And if this box is composed itself of a bunch of different modules, uh, there's a very simple way of computing the gradient called uh, backpropagation that goes back to a long time. Uh, it's basically a chain rule. Uh, chain rule applied to sort of, uh, not scalar modules, but sort of vector functions, if you want. Okay, so we assume here we have a kind of a network of, of modules, and each module has an input vector, an output vector, an input vector here, xi minus one, an output vector xi, a sort of internal parameter wi, and uh, some, you know, it computes some function fi of xi minus one wi. Okay, and we can just compute the output by rippling the, the uh, data through, uh, computing the output of each of those modules in sequence uh, until we get uh, the answer here, here that we can compare with the answer we want. So for example, in Torch, um, you would implement this with uh, uh, you know, some sort of object, let's call it M1 for the first module, and there would be a forward function uh, for this object that would take the input vector and then would produce the hidden layer uh, called hid here, and then you could uh, apply the same forward function to the second module, it will take as input the hidden layer and produce the output, okay? So it's a very simple f way of writing uh, feed-forward uh, neural net if you want with uh, kind of a torch uh, symbolism. Um, uh, but in fact, in torch there is already a, a kind of a, a class that allows you to do this called sequential, so you create one of those sequential objects and then you add the module M1 to it, and then you add the module M M2 to it, and then if, when you call the forward function on this model, uh, it, it sort of does the right thing. It, does the, it applies the forward function sequentially to each of the modules that you added. Um, so that's easy. 
Now the problem is, how do, you, how do we compute the gradient? So what we need to do is we need to compute the gradient of this uh, uh, cost function, this energy, whatever you want to call it, with respect to each of the parameters of each of the boxes here, right? And we're going to do this with chain rule. So let's assume we already know the, uh, those, green, those green things here. This, uh, well, let, let's take this one. Let's assume we, we know this green vector. And this green vector is the same size as this red vector. And it's going to be the vector of uh, derivatives of this criterion with respect to each component of this uh, xi vector. Okay? So this is a gradient vector. And its size is the same as xi. It's d over d xi. If you can't read this, it's, the color is unfortunate. Um, so let's assume we know this green vector. Uh, what we need is uh, multiply this green vector by the uh, Jacobian of this box, basically a big table that gives you the partial derivative of every output here with respect to every input here, and every output here with respect to every parameter here. And by multiplying this vector by this, uh, these two Jacobians, we'll get those two vectors. So if we write this down, we can write it this way. Um, so let's start with the gradient with respect to the parameters. So the gradient of the energy with respect to the parameter of the ice box here, uh, dE over dWi, is equal to d over dXi, which is this green vector, multiplied by uh, dFi, which is the, uh, um, the this dFi over dWi, which is the Jacobian matrix of this uh, module with respect to its uh, a parameter vector. Okay. So that, that's a matrix. That's a line. That's a row vector, if you want. That's a row vector, and that's a matrix. Okay. This row vector has, this, has the same size as xi. This row vector has the same size as wi. And this matrix is a matrix that has um, uh, as many columns as xi as components, as, as many rows as wi as components. Um, and so the Jacobian matrix, the KL entry of this matrix, is simply the partial derivative of the, of the kth output of that box, the kth component of that box with respect to the uh, L's uh, component of, uh, of WI, okay, which is indicated here. Okay, so that's for the, the weights. We can do the same thing for propagating the gradients backwards to the next box. And uh, we can write this kind of recurrence relation, which is that it is simply chain rule when you think about it. Uh, d over d x i minus 1, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to the input of the box, is equal to d over d x i, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to the output of the box, multiplied by the Jacobian of the box with respect to its input. So each module here has two Jacobians, one uh, which are the partial derivatives of the output with respect to the inputs, and one of the outputs with respect to the parameters, as I said before. Um, Let's see. So it's some, sometimes more convenient to write the recurrence relation this way so that we have column vectors instead of row vectors. So I transposed everything here. So this is a column vector now. Uh, and this is a matrix. And that's also a column vector. Um, so that's backdrop for you. Um, that's all you need to, uh, to know, really. Um, so you start by computing the derivative of the criterion or energy or whatever with respect to xn. And presumably, you know how to do this because you know how to uh, compute the Jacobian of this function because you wrote that function. Um, so now you have the gradient of this with respect to xn. And you propagate through, propagate through, propagate through, propagate through. And then you can compute the gradients with respect to all the, all the weights, OK, until the first module. Um, so it's very simple to, uh, to implement, uh, again, with things like, like Torch or, or Theano. Uh, basically, you say the gradient with respect to the hidden layer uh, for module M2 is, you know, I apply the backward function for this module, which presumably I've written beforehand. And I take as input the, the, the hidden, uh, uh, so let's take this module, for example. Okay, so out G here is, is, is this guy, and uh, hid is this guy and hit G is this green guy. Okay, and I can go further backward with M1. Um, so hit G is this guy, and in is that guy, and in G is would be the gradient with respect to the input, but um, which here in this case I don't really uh, really need. But again, you can use the sequential class to just call the backward method on it, and if the uh, class has been uh, assembled by, by putting a bunch of modules in it, you know, it's going to do the back propagation automatically through it. 
So it's very simple. Okay, so the, the, the nice thing about this is that that allows you to build fairly complex machines out of simple module for which you just need to write two functions, essentially, how to compute the output from the input and how to compute the gradient with respect to the inputs when you know the gradient with respect to the outputs and the inputs. Okay, and for every module you write this, you can do backprop. Um, so you can build a traditional neural net, which is essentially a succession of linear module that multiply their input vector by a matrix and, uh, you know, say a hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity, pointwise nonlinearity, and then another linear module, sigmoid, and then maybe a Euclidean distance. That's a very classical uh, neural net. Um, and so, for example, a linear module, how, how would you write the backprop for linear module? So x out is uh, simply equal to uh, x in multiplied by some matrix, uh, the weight matrix. And uh, to compute the, the gradient of uh, whatever cost function you want with respect to x in, assuming you know the gradient of that cost function with respect to x out, you just write the chain rule here. DE over dx in equals, equal D over dx out, dx out over dx in. And you can convince yourself those two things are equal because you can simplify by dx out, right? And you get the same, the same thing left and right. And dx out over dx in, that's, you know, how do I differentiate this with respect to x in? I get w. In fact, I get w transpose, but what you get is this. If you transpose both, both things, you get that the vector, the column vector now of the gradient with respect to input is equal to the gradient to the uh, gradient vector with respect to output multiplied by the transpose of the matrix. Okay, a similar relationship for the, for the weights. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, so there's sort of various modules if you want. Um, and the way you would do this in Torch, as you will hopefully try to do tomorrow, is uh, you plug all of those modules into a linear module, ignore this tree shape for now. Uh, you put a linear module, a 10H module, which is hyperbolic tangent, uh, pointwise on the RIT. Linear module again, hyperbolic tangent. You add the cost module, and you put this all into, the, into this uh, model object by uh, calling the add function. Uh, you have to also get the, the parameters, collect all the parameters inside of those modules into a big vector so you can feed this to an optimization function. And then you have to do a little bit of hocus pocus, which I'll let Clément uh, explain to you tomorrow, to basically build a, a simple function out of this, which is just a function of the parameters that you're going to feed to, you're going to pass to an optimizer, and the optimizer is just going to optimize it. And it's actually a closure, but I'm, I'm not going to explain that. Clément exp will explain that to you tomorrow. Um, so. Here I explain this in the context of a simple uh, sequential module, but you can apply this to pretty much any kind of structure as long as there is no loop in the connection graph. If there are loops in the connection graph, it's a little more complicated. It's not that much more complicated, but a little more. Uh, but I'm just not gonna talk about this. Um, but you can have any kind of uh, complex connectivity between modules, and this model that I just talked about uh, still applies as long as there is no loop. Okay, uh, so just uh, a little word of warning, though, um, to, to sort of say that, uh, you know, wh why is it that uh, people for a number of years have been scared about uh, uh, neural nets and deep learning and um, have concentrated on learning, learning procedures uh, where the cost function is convex? And here is an example that might scare you. And it's a very simple neural net. It's probably the simplest neural net the simple two-layer neural net ever. It has one input, one hidden, one hidden unit, and one output. And it just, you just train it to, uh, produce the, to compute the identity function. So it has to map 0.5 to 0.5 and minus 0.5 to minus 0.5. And it's a you know, normal neural net where you have a single weight, you have a hyperbolic tangent function, then another weight, a hyperbolic tangent function, and then the cost function you know, subtracts uh, the output of the network from the output you want and squares it, and that's the function you want to minimize. So basically that's the desired output and that's the, output, that's the input you feed, which is also uh, the desired output. And when you look at the, the uh, shape of the uh, cost function, this, 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 this objective function here, in the space of W0 and W1, it has this really kind of weird saddle kind of shape where the solutions are here, are those little kind of, uh, it's, it's this little kind of you know, curve here. There's another one uh, symmetric on the other side. There's a saddle point right here at zero, zero. Um, and, and then there are kind of high mountains, mountains on each side of the, of the saddle. So if you start from some random point, 
uh, say if you start from the top of this mountain, the first thing that's going to happen is that the weight vector, if it follows the gradient, is going to go down close to the uh, saddle point, and then it's going to take a while to decide which way to go, and eventually it's going to find one of the two solutions. Okay? Uh, but it's very ill-conditioned. It's uh, very non-convex. But as you see here, there are two local minima, but the local minima are not a problem because they're, they're equivalent. You know, it doesn't matter which one you find, they'll give you the same result. So that's an example where you have a non-convex function with local minima, but it doesn't really matter which local minimum you find. And there is sort of a, a kind of hand-wavy argument uh, that says that if, you're, if the neural net you build is much larger than necessary for the task you want to solve, um, it's going to be fairly easy to find one of those minima. Um, because the number of quadrants, if you want, in which there is a solution is going to be fairly large relative to the size of the entire space. Whereas if the network has just the right size for the problem, it's going to be very hard for the learning algorithm to figure out which of those quadrants actually has a solution. Okay? So the, the uh, moral of the story here is that you need to oversize your neural nets if you want. And if you oversize them, they're going to have too many parameters. You're going to have to regularize them. Or you're going to have to pre-train them with unsupervised training, which is basically the entire idea of deep learning. Yes, question. Is the argument actually based on some theory, or is it just intuition? Uh, it's mostly intuition. Uh, it'd be nice if someone did some theory about it. Uh, maybe there's some mathematicians in the room here who are ready to pick this up. Uh, that's an open question. Uh, there are some empirical studies going back to the early 90s about this, uh, people who tried to, uh, to study this. There's also some theory. Um, so the, uh, I, I have to take it back. The, 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 there is theoretical work about this by uh, people whose background is uh, statistical physics. So there's a series of papers by a guy called David Saad, S-A-A-D, who is in, in Britain, uh, and Sarah Soria, and uh, a few other people. And they, what they studied is a situation where you have a, teach, a teacher neural net, if you want, and a student neural net, and, and trying to figure out if, uh, and so you, you're sort of running data through the teacher neural net to, 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 uh, to generate data to train the student neural net. And the question is, is the student neural net going to reach the same solution as the, as the teacher? And how long is it going to take? And basically, they, they come up with um, analysis that it's all about a problem of symmetry breaking. So if you have, if the two networks have exactly the same size, then it's going to be very, very hard for the student network to figure out which uh, combination of weights the, the teacher network has. Uh, but if you make it larger, then it's actually going to work pretty, pretty easily. Um, so there's some theoretical work. It's kind of more on the sort of statistical physics flavor than mathematics, really. Any other question at this point? Okay, this is more sort of motivational for deep learning more than anything else. Um, so let's talk about convolutional nets now. So convolutional nets are sort of a, a fairly old idea uh, for um, that are kind of geared towards uh, processing data or recognizing uh, data that comes in the form of uh, arrays. And particularly arrays where uh, local groups of variables within those arrays are highly correlated. So if you look at an image, for example, so uh, the pixels of an image, you could think of it as an array. Um, and it's very likely in a natural image that neighboring pixels will have similar values, OK? Just because edges are rare, um, statistically speaking. And so there is high correlation between local patches of pixels uh, in natural images. Another way of seeing this is that if you take a, uh, uh, say, a 5 by 5 patch in a natural image, and, and you take all 5 by 5 patch from the collection of all pictures you have on your hard drive, um, the complete collection of 5 by 5 patch will not fill up the 25-dimensional uh, uh, space of, uh, of, of pixels. There's a lot of combinations of pixels that just never occur, or very rarely occur. So the distribution of you know, 25 neighboring pixels is very, very kind of uh, special. Okay? And so you can exploit that. Uh, what that means is that you don't really need 25 variables to represent 25 pixels, because there are dependencies between them. Okay? So the first thing you would think of is say, well, you, know, you can compress that to kind of a smaller representation, say, using principal component analysis. But that would actually be a bad idea, because 
compressing the representation doesn't make it easier to classify. It makes it harder to classify. What you want is expand the dimension of the representation in a nonlinear way so that things become more separable. Okay? Um, but basically, you have this idea that you want to process groups of, of variables because they are highly correlated, and, and there is an advantage in representing them as a group. Okay, something else about images is the fact that the statistics of pixels is the same uh, anywhere uh, on an image. Uh, statistics are, in images are translation invariant, if you want. Okay, so whatever feature or encoding is useful for, say, the upper left part of, a, of, a, of, of, of any image would probably be useful also for the uh, you know, lower right part of the image. And so that's the idea of uh, using a, a kind of re replicating feature detectors all over the image, um, regardless of their, of their position. Um, OK, so before I go into the details of this, um, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about uh, kind of a general type of architecture that are used by convolutional nets, but also are used by uh, sort of mainstream approaches to uh, object recognition in computer vision, as well as uh, speech recognition. And you could think of the, this feature transform modules I was talking about earlier as being composed of essentially four uh, submodules. The first one would be some sort of normalization. Um, and by normalization, I, would, uh, I mean something like removing the mean, uh, normalizing the variance of all the variables. So a technical term for this in signal processing would be whitening. But whitening sometimes can be expensive, so you, you, you could use kind of a you know, poor man's version of it. Um, but that's the role of this. Uh, then you have uh, uh, what I call here a filter bank, but is really a linear transform. Okay, so uh, if, you, if this is an array, this is also going to be an array, and then you're, you're going to transform this through a linear transform, a matrix, basically. Could be a very sparse matrix, could have some special properties. Then this is going to go through a nonlinear transform, uh, maybe a hyperbolic tangent on all the components, maybe a winner take all, maybe something like that. And then some pooling operation, and the role of this pooling operation will become clear in a minute. And then you can take this module and repeat it. And as long as you can train the filter banks, uh, you can train the entire uh, architecture. Um, the pooling operation consists in uh, taking the response of uh, a group of variables from the, from the previous module and aggregating their outputs by, say, computing the max or the average or the uh, log of some exponentials, or the, the uh, p-norm, or something like that. Some sort of symmetric function. Okay, and why we want to do this will become clear in a second. Um, this, this whole architecture is actually based on, uh, again, inspired from, from biology, from classic work in, uh, in uh, biology by uh, Huber and Wiesel from in the 60s, and, uh, and many classical uh, feature extraction modules in computer vision like SIFT and GIST and HUG and things like that are uh, actually very much inspired by this as well. Um, okay, so let's go into the detail of uh, convolutional nets for the, the special case of images here, but we could also apply this to uh, other types of signals. So here we have an input uh, field, and what we're going to do is we're going to compute a uh, weighted sum of a small neighborhood of uh, variables in this input, and uh, and this will be the, the value we're going to write at the corresponding location on the output of the first module, this linear module. Uh, and we call this a feature map. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the, the weights that we use to compute this weighted sum here, and we're going to replicate them over the entire, we're going to take this little window and shift it over uh, the entire image, in effect computing a convolution. Okay, so the, the set of weights that we use to compute the linear combination can be seen as a convolution kernel. And we swipe the convolution kernel over the inputs, uh, for every window, we compute the dot product of the, the, of the weights and the pixels that are underneath, and we write the corresponding value, the, the value in the corresponding uh, uh, value in the, in the feature map. So we have a feature map here, which is more or less the same size as the input, maybe minus the border effect of the kernel. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to do this, we're going to repeat this same operation on uh, uh, using multiple kernels, multiple set of weights. So we get multiple uh, answers here. Um, and then the pooling operation, so there's going to be a nonlinear operation taking place here. And then the pooling operation will consist in taking the response of some of those filters and then uh, aggregating their response uh, using, say, an average or a max or something of that type. 
Um, and I want to show you, if I may, yeah, this. OK, so that's a, an old example of a convolutional net at work. Uh, so here is an input. This is the result of the first, uh, uh, the first layer, if you want, the, applying the filters. There's a sigmoid function also that's being applied, uh, a uh, hyperbolic tangent. Uh, this one, hyperbolic tangent. Um, so uh, I'm not showing the, the, uh, the actual filters here. I'm just showing the result of applying the filters to, to the input for, uh, for all, those input, all, the, all those translated threes. Um, <coughs> And you see that each of those uh, uh, filters extracts a different feature. So this guy you know, reacts to edges that are kind of oriented this way. That's where you get sort of this black activation. Uh, this guy likes kind of edges, regardless of where they are. Maybe just the top edges. Um, this guy likes the bottom edges. OK, and then this pooling operation takes uh, the response in the neighborhood and then computes the average and passes the result through a hyperbolic tangent. And so you get those reduced resolution map. And, and there's one more thing we do is that uh, we, you know, we pull the response of a group, and we shift the group over which we do the pooling by more than one pixel, so that this map has a lower resolution than that map. Um, and the result of this is that you build a little bit of uh, robustness to distortions and shifts and things like that, scaling. OK, so if, if this guy shifts by one pixel, this guy is going to shift by one half pixel, whatever that means. Right? OK, and then the second stage just repeats the same operation. So this guy here is a result of applying a filter to this, 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 and this. It's different filters, and then combining the response, just adding them up, and then passing the result through a sigmoid function, hyperbolic tangent. You get this. And then this is the result of, again, convolving these guys with six different filters adding the results, passing the result through a hyperbolic tangent. That's the result. And each of these guys use a different set of filters. Actually, not all of those are connected to each of, to each of those, but um, it's kind of a sparse uh, connection pattern here. And so as you see here, those, those features are kind of more abstract. Uh, they're influenced by a fairly large area on the input that we pull again. And then there's another stage of filters again. And now the filters are the same size as the, as the feature map, so you only get essentially you, you get one pixel, essentially. Um, or at least it's shifted. Uh, I mean, you get, you get uh, one column here corresponds to, is influenced by a 32 by 32 uh, pixel uh, input. And uh, each column is separated, uh, correspond to kind of a, a different 32 by 32 window shifted by four pixels on the input. <clears throat> so if you, if you take the central column here, it's really kind of looking at all those translated threes. And there's something interesting about this. So this guy was trained, supervised, to just uh, classify uh, handwritten digits. OK, there's uh, no magic, just using stochastic gradient descent. Um, but there's something interesting about this, which is that if you look at this pixel here, this pixel goes from white to black to white. OK, what that means is that the, uh, the curve that uh, where all those, those translated trees um, reside is, is not flat. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a curve with a curvature because it goes, because at least one of the, one of the uh, coordinates goes from white to black to white. Okay? So, it's, so it has a curvature. Um, and if, you, if you're going to translate and distort the number three in all possible ways, you're going to get a sort of a, a manifold of all the threes, right? And if you do the same with a five, you're gonna get another manifold of all the fives. And the problem is that those two manifolds are very, very much entangled. So there's no way you can separate those two manifolds with a linear classifier, for example. Okay, because they're very, very much entangled. They don't touch. At least if you don't have any three that look like five, they don't touch, but they are very, very um, uh, sort of wrapped up around each other. OK, but if you look at this representation here, here there's hardly any value that goes from dark to black to dark or vice versa. Maybe this guy blinks a bit. Uh, but other than that, they all go from dark to, to bright or bright to dark. And what that tells you is that the surface here is much flatter. OK, the surface formed by all the, the, the shifted threes is flatter in that space than it is in that space. Okay. That's good, because that means it's going to be much easier to separate uh, categories in that space by plugging, a, say, a linear classifier. Okay? And in fact, it's been trained with a linear classifier on top of it, so it's not surprising that 
you know, it, 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 it produces such uh, appropriate representations. Okay. Um, so you can apply those, those convolutional nets to all kinds of tasks, and I think Clément is planning to take you through this particular example tomorrow of recognizing uh, house numbers. This is a data set that came, came out of Google for the interested in uh, reading the numbers on the houses to kind of register the, the street view little guy with house numbers. Um, and convolutional nets work really well on this. They work really well on recognizing sort of small images of various types. Um, uh, but you can also apply uh, convolutional nets to, uh, to uh, temporal data, sequ sequential data instead of uh, image data. So that's an example for, say, epilepsy data where you have electrodes stuck in the brain of someone uh, and you're kind of measuring the signal and then an epilepsy seizure occurs. And it'd be nice to be able to predict that epilepsy seizure is going to occur by just looking at the signal before that. Uh, you can use convolutional nets for that. So people have used uh, temporal convolutional nets. They used to be called time delay neural nets. Um, back in the old days. Uh, actually, that's a paper by Jeff. Um, back in 86, I, I believe. Um, 88. 88. Um, and, and the idea is, is very similar to for, uh, for images. You, you have, so in, in, in images, you have a two-dimensional signal, and it can be multi-channel if you have color images. Uh, uh, for a time delay neural net, one of the dimensions is time and the other dimension is channels, okay? Or it could be frequency if it's, uh, if it's a speech signal, for example. Uh, but think of it as channel, is easier. So here you have kind of a, a temporal signal, temporal sequence, and there are there's strong correlations between successive values, and then you have different channels, and there may or may not be correlations between the channels. So you may or may not want to do convolutions across channels. Uh, but you're gonna do temporal convolutions, and basically it's the same, exactly the same architecture as before, except it's 1D instead of 2D. Okay, I don't even need to answer to, uh, to explain that much more than that. Here's an example of a convolutional net. Think of uh, this dimension as being time, since as this dimension had been equal to one, and think as you know, the third dimension here, which is in this case equal to one, as being equal to the number of channels you're looking at. Or maybe we should start from here. This is number of channels, this is time, and this is dimension one. And, uh, a convolutional net over time is just the same as over, over space. Uh, there are 3D versions of this for, say, 3D image segmentation or for video analysis and things like this. Uh, it's obvious to, you can obviously generalize this to uh, more dimensions. Yes? Right, so uh, you don't need it to be completely invariant. You need it to be, you need the statistics to be the same uh, for, for the convolution to, to make sense, right? Yeah. Well, so for epilepsy, so what happens for epilepsy data is that um, the um, you know it, you never know where your system is going to be applied in time, right? So you can't rely on that to uh, you know relative to the epilepsy seizure, you don't know when the network is going to be applied. Maybe it's going to look at this particular uh, window of time. Maybe it's going to look at this window of time. Um, so you can't rely on the fact that you know which window of time is being applied to. You have to have a processing that's independent of where it's applied. So that's, that's what makes sense. I mean, basically, it's, it, it relies on the idea that you have local motifs that are important to detect. And if a local motif is important in one place, it's probably important in another place. So there's no s strong assumption about you know, uh, stationarity or anything like that. It's more you know, um, usefulness of, uh, of features. So those convolutional nets are used everywhere for all kinds of applications, and they've been deployed commercially since you know the mid '90s uh, for handwriting recognition, for you know vending machines, advertising posters, uh, biological image analysis. Uh, uh, Google uses it for face and license plate removal from Street View images. Uh, Microsoft has used them for handwriting recognition, speech detection, and there's you know lots of applications of them. Uh, but those are all kind of supervised. So here is a really cool application of uh, supervised. A convolutional net that actually was uh, developed by Clément Farabé, who uh, talked just uh, gave the last talk. And it's an interesting version of convolutional net that uh, has uh, kind of a multi scale um, uh, architecture a bit. So, the idea here, or the problem we're trying to solve, 
is to uh, label every pixel uh, in an image with the, ob the category of the object that it belongs to, okay? So here you have an image and you want to label all those pixels as road and this is person and this is building and the sky and et cetera. That's a car and that's a river, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so uh, the, the, what, uh, uh, what Clément devised was uh, this sort of multi-scale convolutional net where you take the image, it's a three-channel image because it's got Y, U, and V components, uh, luminance and chrominance components. And uh, you, you take the uh, image at its original resolution and you take the same image at half resolution. You just you know, reduce it and then reduce it by a factor of four. And you're gonna feed those images after proper uh, high-pass filtering and contrast normalization. You're gonna feed those three images to three copies of the same convolutional net, essentially. So here is one thing that's interesting about convolutional nets. Convolutional nets don't care about the size of the input. The only thing that matters is the, the uh, size of the kernels, right? So once you've trained a convolutional net with particular size kernels, particular architecture, you can apply it to input images of any size. It doesn't matter what size it is. Uh, it's variable size. And um, the reason for this is that you can always apply the convolutions to larger images, and you can always interpret the output as itself a convolution. I'll probably come back to this uh, af afterwards. But, um, but for this particular example, uh, it, it suffice to say that one particular output here, um, so one particular output value here corresponds to the detection of one category at one location. Uh, so each of those uh, planes, if you want, correspond to different locations. And uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, one plane corresponds to all locations and then different planes different, correspond to different categories. Uh, so if there are 33 categories, for example, there would be 33 planes here, one for each category. And uh, each location here corresponds to a particular window on the input. Okay, so one particular location here is influenced by a 46 by 46 window on this high resolution image. Okay? Um, but because we have the same convolutional net here going through this, um, this particular output here would be influenced here by a window that's twice the size because the image here is, is half the size. So it's, so it'd be 46 by 46 on this image, but that corresponds to 92 by 92 on that image, right? And then going through this path, again, it's 46 by 46 window here, but that would correspond to a, a 184 by 184 window on the, on the input. And what that means is that um, one particular output here is influenced by a very, very large context to make a decision for the category of a particular pixel at the center of this window here, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's taking into account at high resolution, the surrounding of that pixel, at lower resolution, a larger surrounding of that pixel, and at a yet lower resolution, basically the entire image. Okay, so it's got a lot of information it can take into account to make a decision about a single pixel. And this is really what distinguishes uh, this kind of approach to more traditional approaches in computer vision, where the decision is made more locally, but then there is uh, some sort of graphical model to kind of make sure all the decisions are, are consistent with each other. Uh, um, that tend to actually make uh, the system quite a bit sl uh, slower. So there's one, one bit of trick here, which I, I didn't explain, which is that um, uh, this, this uh, path in the convolutional net is gonna produce feature maps at a particular resolution, and this guy is gonna produce feature map at half the resolution. If we wanna be able to combine them with the previous ones, we're going to upsample them to the same resolution as these guys, okay? So this guy here, this path here, produces 256 uh, feature maps. This guy produces another 256 feature maps. And this guy, another 256 feature map. So the decision is made on the basis of 700, 700 uh, um, and, and whatever it is, um, uh, features, and uh, and the you know input window corresponding input windows are, are pretty large. Yeah. So this is what the images look like after the high pass filtering and contrast normalization and sort of remapping into RGB space. And those are the three convnets, and there is upsampling of the resulting feature maps, and those go to the, the, the classifier. Okay, so if you take the output of the classifier, you get sort of kind of a blurry response. Um, and so uh, Clément and uh, Kemi Coupri, who is also here, use a very simple trick, which consists of computing very simple uh, segments of the image that are called superpixels, and then simply labeling an entire superpixel by the category that wins within that superpixel. And, uh, and that works really well. Uh, in fact, it beats the state of the art, or it comes very close to it, but it's 100 times faster. Um, uh, particularly on this data set, which has 33 categories. Um, there, it, it beats the state of the art quite, quite, uh, quite well. 
I'm not going to go into the details of uh, the results so as not to bore you and because I'm out of time. I'm just going to show you a little demo, a little video of this. Um, so this is a uh, panoramic camera on the helmet of uh, a person on a bike. Well, you can see the shadow of the person here with the helmet and the cameras on the head. And it's, um, we run this video through the system and it's basically lab labeling every pixel. So this particular one, uh, the labeling is done independently on every frame. And so there is no consistency between frame and frame and it's making stupid mistakes like for example, here it's uh, classifying the road as uh, sand. So it's like a beach. This is Washington Square Park in New York, so no beach, I can tell you. Uh, but it, you know, it finds the pedestrians and the trees and the sky and the buildings. And so this is another example where here the superpixels have temporal consistency. So the superpixels are not just over space, but also over time. And so it makes more uh, consistent decisions over time so that the, the things kind of, let me show, show that to you again. Uh, there's quite a bit of mistakes, but it's, it's okay. So it's red is pedestrian and blue is the car and that's a tree. It's missing the sky. A little bit. Okay, uh, let me stop here and uh, we'll have a break and come back.